Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about uh, the London Business Network, but more specifically about Compete4 uh, and how you can get involved uh, in procurement opportunities arising from the uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games to be held in London in 2012. As I say, my name is Mike Mulvey. I'm Chief Executive of the organization. Um, just to, to recap on uh, what Janet was saying about uh, the two organizations, I'm not going to go into uh, the detail again that we've already covered, but I just want to explain uh, from a procurement perspective, these two organizations do act in slightly different ways. The Olympic Delivery Authority is uh, what's called a public sector organization. In other words, they're funded by uh, the government uh, uh, and uh, UK taxes. Um, and they'll be spending about £6 billion on developing mainly the Stratford site is obviously the, uh, the one that's taking the, the, the vast amount of uh, investment, but also other investments uh, uh, around the country. Um, they'll be putting on about 2,000 uh, direct contracts, which will result in about 50,000 supply chain opportunities. And I'll explain how that impacts on Compete4 shortly. But the key element about the ODA is because they're a public sector uh, organization, they buy under public sector rules, uh, uh, and that means that they will expect you to have um, four times the turnover of the value of the contract. So if there's a contract, for instance, for um, a quarter of a million pounds, uh, then they will expect you to have a, a, a turnover of um, a million pounds. It's all about risk mitigation, and that is part and parcel because they're a government body that's investing government money. Uh, going on to the London Organising Committee, uh, they, they uh, buy in a slightly different way in the sense that um, uh, they, can, they don't have to buy best value. They're funded by uh, pub, uh, private money in the sense that they, they're, they're funded by, by sponsorship, uh, by ticket money, uh, by merchandising, and by television rights. Uh, and so uh, they can barter with organizations. They can say, uh, give us your goods and services at a, at a discounted rate, and, and we'll uh, allow you to call yourself an Olympic supplier. Because nobody can call themselves an Olympic supplier unless they have the authority uh, of London 2012. So they, they, they'll they're also, because they're buying for a period which is a very short period of time, um, you know, you're talking about probably only six weeks, really, that they're, they're wanting some of these uh, uh, goods and services for. They're looking for suppliers to come up with innovative ways of supply, because uh, once the games are over, they, they, they don't want to be left with a whole load of products uh, that they can't uh, uh, get rid of. So they're, they're particularly interested in any organizations who are prepared to look at, say, uh, leasing goods or renting goods to them uh, and taking them back. So it's a, it's a thing to consider. There are other opportunities, of course, that we're embracing, uh, opportunities that are arising from the, the cultural side of the Olympics. Uh, and many of, uh, uh, of the boroughs around London uh, will be spending money, uh, uh, and there's going to be lots of opportunities going on on, on Compete4 for, for that. And obviously, there's also uh, in investment being made in the uh, transport infrastructure and opportunities already going on Compete4 for, for those. How does the supply chain work? Well, I'll go in particular with the Olympic Delivery Authority, because they're the ones who are doing most of the buying at the moment. Um, and, uh, uh, but the London Organizing Committee have got a similar sort of pyramid. And basically, you start with the Olympic Delivery Authority at the top. Uh, and they have a, a delivery partner called CLM, uh, who's an in international um, program management company consisting of C2HM, Hill, Lang O'Rourke, and Mace. And together, they actually manage the relationship between the various contractors uh, in, in the tiered structure that you see before you. So in, in this particular circumstance, the ODA will have let their contract uh, for the aquatic center to a main contractor who is Balfour Beatty. They, in turn, will let their, their main uh, contract to a, a major subcontractor to build the swimming pool for them. Uh, they will have someone uh, putting tiles at the bottom of the pool. Uh, uh, that will be supplied from a bricklaying subcontractor. Who uh, the, the tiles will be supplied from a brick merchant uh, and through a distribution company from a manufacturer. Uh, uh, and ultimately, the raw materials come from a quarry. Now, all that is the Olympic supply chain, and all that 
is where the 50,000 contracts comes from. And there's one of these pyramids for each of the areas of uh, the Olympic supply. But in addition to those, we've also got lots and lots of other opportunities that actually exist uh, between, uh, in the relationships between those suppliers. And these can be for things like catering and security and, uh, and tools and uh, a plant and uh, a printing, all sorts of opportunities uh, for businesses uh, right across the world. Um, and how do we make sure that these go on to uh, our system? Well, basically, uh, the Olympic Delivery Authority have put a contractual obligation. That means there's a, a, a legal contract placed in the Tier 1 contract that requires them to put 20% of their contracts on, on to Compete for. Um, and that contract uh, obligation is actually passed down from the Tier 1 contract to down to the Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4, etc., etc. Uh, and then you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen uh, the buyer engagement team are responsible for going in and seeing the buyers at each of the levels and making sure that the, uh, uh, the contracts get on the system. Um, why not 100%, a lot of people ask me. Well, basically, one of the reasons why we deal with the major contractors is because they have a very reliable supply chain. So we're not in the, in the um, uh, mold to actually break supply chains. What we want to do uh, is to take the 20% the of, uh, uh, of the contracts that most of the time they haven't necessarily let when they come to the negotiating table. And those are the contracts that are going on the system, and those are the contracts uh, which you can apply for. And this is an example of to, uh, uh, how it works. You'll see on the left-hand side, um, the Tier 1 contract was let to um, an organization that was building bridges and structures. They, in turn, let a, a Tier 2 contract to uh, a company that's providing temporary site electrics. Uh, they, in turn, let a contract to someone who's doing some builder's work to provide the support for the electrics. Uh, and they, in turn, are looking for someone who's supplying uh, personal protection equipment. So you can see how the opportunities go down to each level, obviously getting smaller and smaller as we go down. The great thing is that you can see that uh, ODA and LOCOG have let 451 direct opportunities to Tier 1 contractors who, in turn, have let 509 opportunities. And so you see them building. The Tier 2 contracts are now 1,402. Uh, and uh, the, the Tier 3 and Tier 4 are growing now. We expect the Tier 3 to go up to about 3,000 uh, and the Tier 4 to get up to about 2,000. So you can see how there's lots and lots of opportunities at different sizes, lots of opportunities also to partner with UK companies to, to supply um, uh, if you feel that's appropriate for your business.